Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? It's good to see you. I'm finally back from uh, Copy Decks in Taipei. <coughs> know my voice changer you know how to use it is it working again yeah i didn't have it turned on it's it's back on now everything's just fine <laughs> no no problem excellent <laughs> he, he so. fights the polite zeitgeist with my <laughs> no you've no, messed he it up the zeitgeist with polite might <laughs> i messed it up oh, you know God. you guys should just one day come over and hang out while we're doing our mic checks they, they last about four hours and they usually uh there's usually <laughs> lots of that there's usually lots of mic row rowing Rows of micro rowing, and there's lots of Mike, bananas. It, it's it's micros, micro crow, and also Felis caddis is your taxonomic nomenclature. <laughs> Indeterminate ca- quadruped, carnivorous by nature. <laughs> now you guys know what goes on behind the scenes before we get started, and now it is really time to get started. Uh, did I mention I'm exhausted? We're going to do this anyway. All right, the FCC was hacked after John Oliver called for net neutrality trolls. So he did this epic rant. John Oliver has the new, um, uh, what's the, his show on HBO called? Uh, Today, Tonight, or Tonight, Tomorrow, or what's it called? I forgot what it's called. Last last week, tonight, I think. Yeah, last week, tonight. There we go. Last. Yeah. So he did this epic rant. Kind of like our show. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeah, I think he, I think he watches our show. You know, Wendell, in his little rant right here um, on last week tonight, where he's talking about net neutrality, he actually said some phrases that were almost ver- verbatim uh, from your mouth. So I think <laughs> I don't. I'm an egomaniac. I, I think everyone watches. I, us. I don't know. If, yeah, I think it. I mean, it is. It is sort of megalomania. But I think that uh, the we made the joke about the dingo eating the baby. But I think that we cut that. So are they? Do they bug the offices? John Oliver, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I know who you're working for, and I'm not sure of your intentions, sir. Anyway, so speaking of intentions, he made this epic rant where he's telling everyone to go to the FCC's website. And, um, uh, you know, it, it could just be coincidence. He Maybe he didn't cause this. But a bunch of hackers went there, and they started bombarding uh, the website with hacks. And they didn't do a standard DDoS attack. Uh, what they did was a, a database DOS attack. And um, what they were doing was they were sending comments, hitting the database, and at the same time searching for that same comment. And what they were doing, they were recalling the same node over and over again until it just completely melted the system. What I think is funny about all this, and, and this is kind of the, the thing that I wanted to have the, you know, as, as the takeaway, the FCC's commenting system is 17 years old. Let that sink in. <laughs> the Federal Communications, the Federal hey, y'all. Communications Commission, 17 years old. Ridiculous. Yeah. It is completely insane. I mean, why wouldn't you just... It's like, hey, y'all, come on, let's comment on this. And then it's like, oh, no one's commented on it? Here come the unwashed masses. Yeah, all of them. All of them at once. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some other things. Google Glass. Finally, there's some creative use for Google Glass. And that, that creative use is, is shooting people without getting your head blown off. Now there's an app for Google Glass that works with Wi-Fi equipped smart rifles. And uh, the way this works is you can like put the rifle, you know, I'll just play the damn video. There's a video here. I'll just, you know, show you exactly what it works. It's much easier to see what's going on. So there he's got his glass on, you know, he can just throw the gun up on, uh, I don't know, a bank, an embankment or, or through a window or whatever. And he can see the target with an on-screen display using Google Glass and then he can fire and take it out. Now here's what's interesting. This works with Wi-Fi. This works with Bluetooth. And it also works even over the internet. So people in an office can sit back and see everything that's going on. Do you see three different ways that this could be hacked? That's, that's the first thing in <laughs> my mind was like, wow, it can be hacked in three different convenient ways. That's perfect. I can see these things going off in people's hands randomly. Or how about this? Let's say a soldier, he's out and he's in the field and you know, back in you know, some office somewhere, There is perhaps someone in the Army, someone in the Marines, or whatever, that people in D.C. do not like. All they have to do is watch the guy's on-screen display, and as soon as his rifle gets anywhere near that guy, just press a button, and then, oh, his his gun discharged, let's throw him in the brig. I don't know. That was actually a thing in Texas. Like, you could go (laughs) hunting, deer hunting, over the Internet, and uh, they made a law. It turns out that wasn't illegal. 
So they had to make a law to make that illegal to shut that down because people were, I mean, it was like, you know, the Terminator, but it wasn't a Terminator. It was just like a gun on a, on an ATV and you could drive around shooting deer. And it's like, mm, uh, we probably shouldn't allow this. Texas. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Google Chrome has started blocking extensions that are found outside of the web store. A lot of people were sideloading uh, extensions to do any number of different things. And I want to say before we move on, developers and um, I forget who else, but developers and that sort of thing can still sideload extensions. They say they're doing this to stop malware, but I'm not sure if there's any other in intentions as well. A lot of times they're trying to stop, you know, third party ad blockers and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah. Well, Google's been accused of making this a <coughs> walled garden for those extensions. And that's not inaccurate. I mean, that this basically is turning Chrome into a walled garden. So, I mean, you know, what's next, Android? But at the same time, there has been a lot of malware in the wild that goes in as a Chrome extension. So, I, you know, it's, which is the lesser of two evils? I mean, any idiot should be able to avoid malware. But it's kind of making the browser idiot-proof. But you're right now, it is a walled garden. And I... I, you know, let me just go ahead and uh, throw in a little antidote here. I know a lot of people who use uh, Macs, and they hate PCs because they get viruses. And you know how they get viruses? Because a warning pops up on the screen and said, hey, would you like to go to this site? This site is unsafe. And they click yes, and then they get to that site, and then a warning pops up in the bottom, and it says, hey, a virus has been detected. And they click, I don't care. They make everything go away, and then they <laughs> get a virus, and their computer breaks, and they smash it with a hammer and say, I, I'm going to buy a Mac. Screw this PC. So... I think maybe it's they're trying to make whereas things safer for those with people. A Mac, whereas when that happens with a Mac, if you smash <laughs> the keyboard with your palm and proceed through the warnings, nothing happens because the Mac is not smart enough to run the, the application. <laughs> that or the Mac just, just won't let you. They've already decided that this is not going to happen. So, I mean, you have more freedom on a PC to go ahead and click yes, whereas on a Mac they're just like, nope, you're not, you can't have this. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's what's going to happen Apple with Chrome now. It's a special allowance wand. <laughs> Let's talk about Uber. I've actually been having quite a bit of fun with, with websites like Uber and Airbnb and things that sort of disrupt the status quo and the way the businesses normally work. Now, for those of you who need a little bit of catch up, Uber is a company out of San Francisco, um, and they, they've they created an app that allows you to get rides. You can basically It's, it's basically a taxi service using an app. Uh, but you get essentially rogue or gypsy taxis that come and pick you up or whatever. They're not the standard yellow cabs. And then you can go from point A to point B and pay for it all with the app. It's very, very easy. So in, uh, in Europe, taxi drivers have been staging a protest because they're so angry at the way this is disrupting um, you know, their service. So let's just think about this for a minute. Taxi drivers are angry because uh, you know, this other Uber taxi service is taking all their business. So to protest, they stop offering their service. What do you think is going to happen, Wendell? <coughs> <laughs> well, it turns out what actually happened was Uber had an insane influx of people wanting to use the service. But not only that, I mean, the reason the cab drivers are really ticked off is because to get the medallion, it costs a lot of money to get the license to be the cab driver. And the reason they do that is so that there's not so many cab, cab drivers that no one can earn a living doing cab driving and so like in new york city it's over a million dollars to be a cabbie which is, seems nuts wait a minute i did not know that it, it costs a million bucks to be a cabbie that's yeah that's in new york in new york this article was talking about europe and in europe uh it the uh, costs they cited were like twenty seven thousand to 200 and some thousand that's pretty crazy so i mean According to well, the government in the UK, they say that they're already regulating Uber and you know, they're, they're not going to do anything because they don't bother businesses that they are already regulating. I'm not sure how they're regulating Uber, but it doesn't look like they're going to step in and do anything. So um, me, I'm, I kind of like stuff like this. So, And I'm very, very for Airbnb, even though it's kind of disruptive as well. We've had some stories lately of um, people in New York and they're doing something that's a little bit shady with their Airbnb accounts. Airbnb is a service that allows you to rent out your house or rent out your uh, a room in your house just as if you were a hotel. 
Uh, and that's what we used when we were in Taipei. It was great. We had a really awesome stay. We rented out a, a you know, a two-bedroom apartment and had a kitchen and everything. So it was awesome and it was cheap. But in New York, a lot of people have these rent-stabilized houses that, you know, or homes or apartments that are extremely cheap, like five, six hundred dollars a month rent. And what they're doing is they're moving to a nicer place down the street, keeping that one and renting it out full time on Airbnb. That's a little shady. But um, other than that, I, I like this disruptive stuff that's just person to person without a middleman. It's kind of fun. All right. Let's talk about what the U some more stuff that the UK is doing. Um, the UK, the, the government in the UK has proposed um, some very harsh sentences for hackers. And they've, they've got an interesting definition here for hackers. Um, they, they want to target anyone who creates cyber attacks that result in a loss of life, serious uh, illness or injury, serious damage to national security, or a significant risk thereof. Now, the last two parts are the scary parts because, you know, damaging national security or a significant risk thereof. Now, according to that criteria, the people that discovered the, what was the heart, what's it called? The um, uh, heart bleed. Heart bleed, yeah. People that discovered heart bleed they would probably qualify to be prosecuted under these terms. So that's kind of scary. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just way too loose. I don't know. Do you have any, do you have any more input on this? Well, I, I, it really is. I mean, the, the article that we've picked here, you know, describes it as a witch hunt. And it really is a witch hunt because it's like, I don't want to listen to that. It's not secure. I'm going to put my fingers in my ears. I mean, that already happened with Snowden here. It's like, Snowden's like, look, we, we, we probably shouldn't do this. This is probably really bad. Heartbleed was like, look, you can take over anybody that's using these certain versions of SSL. A lot of companies are like, no, let me put my fingers in my ears. We don't want to talk about that. You know, I'm not at fault. I'm going to blame other people and generally spaz out. These, these companies generally behave badly when you point out that the emperor is wearing no clothes. And there is no protections for an individual security researcher or anything like that in here, which just means the black hats are going to know and the, and the people that need to know aren't going to know. How can we get through to the governments and the powers that be and the people who really do not understand uh, the, the way the, the, the Internet works? How can we get through to them and help them to understand that hacking is not a bad word and hackers are not evildoers uh, per se? Hackers may be actually out there doing, you know, fighting the good fight. They may be out there trying to help businesses and organizations secure themselves. There's a lot of people out there who just get off on the fact that, hey, I'm out here. I'm smarter than a lot of the people on the Internet. I found a back door. I'm going to call up the New York Times and tell them, hey, there's a back door on your website. And what does the New York Times do? They try to put that person in prison for 70 years. It's, it's, that's exactly what happens. How, is there, I mean, <laughs> how can we get through to the powers that be? I don't, I don't know. Okay, so it, the problem is that information is not inherently good or bad. It's what you do with it. I mean, in the 70s, it was like, should we have books that describe how to make napalm? It's the same thing. You know, in the 70s, we came to the conclusion. It's like, well, no, it's probably okay that we have books that describe napalm because World War, World War II is still fresh in everybody's mind and burning books is bad. So information inherently is not bad. It's what you do with it. Indeed. All right, let's uh, move right along here. I want to talk about something that's kind of uh, strange that Comcast is doing. They've decided to turn lots of uh, home routers into public Wi-Fi hotspots. So if you're a Comcast com customer and you have their new fancy router, you may know that there's Wi-Fi on there. And you may also know that it's very difficult for you to get access to that device. A lot of times if you want to make a change, if you want to you know, turn off your Wi-Fi, or if you want to just make a simple change in the router, a, a lot of times at least... When it comes to my experience, I've had to call them and they've had to log into my router through their connection. So what they're doing with these routers, I know there's some other ways. I've actually replaced my Comcast router now because I don't want them to have that much control over what's in my own house. Anyway, so what they're doing with a lot of these routers is they're creating two separate networks, one for you and then a separate one that is a Wi-Fi hotspot for any Comcast user that's within range. So that way, as you're wandering around a city, uh, if there's a lot of Comcast users nearby, you'll be able to hop on these Wi-Fi hotspots and be connected using your Comcast account. They're probably going to do this to attract new customers, and I imagine that, that they're probably thinking about doing something where someone can buy like a Comcast Wi-Fi pass, and when they're in the city, they'll be able to go anywhere in the city, you know, and give Comcast a couple bucks and get on Wi-Fi using these hotspots. Now, what's really strange about this is Comcast is saying that this will not affect 
the performance of the uh, you know of of your Comcast at all because it's two separate networks. So you're telling me that Comcast has enough bandwidth going to you that they can open up a Wi-Fi hotspot and let lots of people connect and still give you 100% of what you're paying for. But they already can't give you 100% of what you're paying for. What am I missing here? This just seems a bit weird. <laughs> We've got 100% of your bandwidth available for you unless you're going to watch Netflix. And when you're going to watch Netflix, we're going to need to get more money from Netflix in order to make that happen. <laughs> but if there's 50 people on your home Wi-Fi, no, no, that's, that's totally different. That's not the same thing. That's something completely other. The other thing that kind of worries me is the security implications here because... I mean, I know it's going to be two separate networks, right? But they're still physically connecting to your box. And there are some smart people out there that are going to, they're going to figure out an exploit. They're going to figure out a way to mess around. Um, I, I mean, Wendell, how difficult really do you think it is to have two networks and be able to you know, get onto the Wi-Fi and then somehow get into your, your private network? Does, I mean, do you think that's a concern or am I being like over, over ridiculous? There have already been a couple of documented cases of that kind of stuff happening. Now, it's on older equipment, the cases that I'm thinking of, but it has happened in the past. So it's possible to create this kind of a problem. If nothing else, with the relatively limited wireless spectrum and devices like AC, especially in a metro metropolitan area, we've just doubled the number of Wi-Fi access points that exist. And so is it that we want people to use the same access points that the public uses on their home network? Then uh, it starts to get into sort of a weird territory. The bottom line here is, is that if you have Comcast or a lot of the other companies like Verizon and AT&T, you're not a customer. You are a resource for these companies. That is how they see you. When they sit down and talk, you're a number and a resource, not an individual and not a customer. Just remember that. And this is Comcast exactly... Comcast has found a way to exploit yeah. your electricity and your, uh, you know, where physically where you are. And it's like, we're going to run our... ISP business off of your electricity and we're going to get a benefit from, you know, your resources, even though you pay us. It's cool. Freaking Comcast, man. All right. Let's, uh, let's take one, one look at this. This is, um, what the BitTorrent, uh, is trying to show everybody what the internet's going to look like if the whole, like, you know, fast lane, slow lane stuff exists. And we've showed you some things like this in the past, but the main thing here is this is what you should show your family and friends and people that do not understand what's going on. Just show them, you know, some of these charts. And I think the visual, you know, representations will really go ahead and uh, fix their brain. Because a lot of times you tell them and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, fast lane, slow lane. And then you show them like, hey, you're going to have to pay five bucks for Google. And if you want, if you want the Wall Street Journal, that's going to be an extra five. And if you want Amazon.com, that's an extra five bucks. So just show them that. And um, yeah, that, that's pretty much all. These are older. Do. Yeah. But I mean, it, you really should... It, this is this is they want a tiered system like they have with cable right now. This is exactly the cable system. This is what they want to do to the internet because the internet is easy for anybody to sell you interesting content and they're not necessarily going to own the content that you want to buy. So it's like crap, we've got to sour the milk on the other stuff that you want so that you'll buy our milk instead of the other more delicious milk that could be anywhere on the internet. So we said it before and we'll say it again. BitTorrent itself is already in the slow lane, and that's part of why they did this campaign. Um, you know, the original reason that the FCC sued Comcast is because Comcast was throttling the crap out of BitTorrent. Still happening. Nothing's been done. That traffic is already in the slow lane. Wendell, have you seen the time, by chance? Uh-oh. No. Rant 30? Huh. It's First Rant 30 in two weeks. Oh, my God. Rant 30. Now, Tom Wheeler has done something good, and all the internet is talking about it. People online are blogging about this and everything. So what Tom Wheeler did, he actually went to Chattanooga, Tennessee. We've talked about Chattanooga, Tennessee before because there they have extremely fast gigabit uh, internet, and it's provided by the municipality of Chattanooga. And it's been, you know, people have been moving there to start their new businesses. They cannot expand anymore because Tennessee has a lot of laws that limit uh, a municipality and most states, I think, well, not most, uh, but a lot of the states have very strict laws that tell municipalities, hey, you guys cannot create your own ISP. And if you do create your own ISP, there's a bunch of limitations that you have to, you know, limitation, limitating guidelines or limiting guidelines that you have to follow. The reason, the reason for that is because uh, 
um, a government entity can be seen as having unlimited funding and it's not really competitive from a business standpoint because it's like a business, you know, they get funding, they get money, they get their business plan together, they have investors. And if they succeed or fail, they can succeed or fail naturally. Whereas if it's a quote unquote government entity, then, you know, they could borrow money from now until the end of time as the national treasury has done and they will still be completely operational. So a business wouldn't be able to do that and so that it's unfair. And so that concept has been taken and twisted around to the point that it's like anytime any city touches anything, these incumbents are going to cry foul. And we've seen it with Google Fiber in Kansas City. We're going to save that thought for just one second. Now, Tom Wheeler on his blog, the official FCC blog here, he wrote a really awesome blog called Removing Barriers to Competitive Community Broadband. And in there, he says, hey, we need to allow these municipalities and allow these cities to run their own fiber, and we need to allow them to create their own, you know, their own Internet services, uh, because look at Chattanooga. And, you know, he met with the mayor, and everything's all great. But let's just hold on for one second right now. Tom Wheeler does not do anything good. Remember, he's the devil, okay? And he took the job as the devil. He's pretended to be an angel, but every single time... He tricks us, you know, into thinking he's doing something right. He turns around and we find out that he's been working with the, uh, you know, the ISP. So, Wendell, what could he really be up to here? What do you think? Well, you got to keep in mind Tom Wheeler's history. You know, he worked in the cable company. And that John Oliver video we mentioned earlier was literally, it's like, it was like Obama was saying, I need someone to watch the baby. Who can I hire to watch the baby? I know. I've got a dingo to watch the baby. That's, you know, that's the John Oliver joke. So it's literally, you know, he was a cable industry executive and now he's running the FCC. So he has Actually, an acute a understanding executive. of the cable industry. I, well, he was, a, he was a cable industry executive, I think, before he was a lobbying exec- executive. Then he went into lobbying. Right. Then he became the FCC chairman. So it's like, wow, revolving door much? Uh, but uh, so... I, you know, it's like we were looking at this and it's like, what is his ulterior motive? I don't understand. So we looked at Provo and we looked at the Carolinas and we looked at some other situations where cities have a bad situation with their bandwidth. And what did they do? Well, in Provo, the incumbents uh, worked with local companies to deploy fiber and do all this kind of stuff. And once the infrastructure was in place, they changed their attitude. And it was like, oh, no, we got to fight this. You know, we think this is unfair competition, blah, blah, blah. And so the companies that owned and had done all the work went under, and their assets were to be sold off for pennies on the dollar. So in the case of Provo, Google stepped in and said, hey, we'll buy that for a dollar. And Provo said, okay. And that really upset incumbents because they were expecting to buy that infrastructure for a dollar. Similar things have played out elsewhere in America, including some of the, some cities in the Carolinas. And so if states spend a bunch of money on their local infrastructure and they can't execute on it and they can't really execute, it, execute on it end to end, investors are going to end up spending a ton of money on this infrastructure and then they're going to go under because they can't actually get internet connectivity to hook that up because they'll need to go to existing incumbents in order to get that. And at that point, they can buy the infrastructure for pennies on the dollar, and they haven't spent any money to upgrade their infrastructure, and they still own everything. That's how we, like the whole dark fiber thing, that's a lot of how we got dark fiber in a lot of cities in America. So to boil this down into the most simple terms possible, they're going to use our tax dollars and our local municipalities to you know, help spread the network. And then after things go wrong or they're going to make sure that things go wrong, they're going to buy it and, cre- and and make it part of their own private corporate network. Is that right? Pretty much? More or less, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, this is a really cynical way to look at it, but this is how it has already played out in places in America. So I think that it's good that that states would be able to do this, but we've got to give them a leg up somehow with connectivity and things like that. Maybe they lease access to those lines or that once the network is in place, local incumbents must use that infrastructure to do whatever. I mean, I'm not sure how that takes place, but we need to sort of have transparency as citizenry into that. So Latin America and the uh, Caribbean are almost out of IPv4 addresses and they are freaking out because it, you know, most of the people involved or most of the companies involved are not ready to move over to IPv6. So they're like, guys, it's time to move over to IPv6 right now. IPv4, IPv4 addresses are gone. Now, this is only the first 
part of the world that is running out. And I mean, there's got to be like a shortage coming up in just about everywhere else because more and more people are getting online. More and more devices are being you know, connected to the internet. More and more mobile handsets are being sold. And those need an IP address as well. I mean, I guess they're not exactly the, the same as a computer, but they, they, you know, if they jump on Wi-Fi, they get an IP address. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're running out of, of IPv4. Now, a lot of the companies, they don't want to switch to IPv6 because it's a lot harder to, f to track and figure out exactly what you're doing. Do you think that's the main reason that they're stalling, Wendell? No, IPv6 is also a lot more complicated. But a lot of the patents around IPv6 have expired in the last few years. So, and a lot of companies were saying, oh, we, we wanted to wait until the patents expire because we were really worried about that. So there's a lot of equipment that supports it. Although in poorer countries, maybe it's harder to get a hold of, but IPv6 will really ease the IPv4 shortage because most of the time you won't need IPv4 except for incoming services. Things like carrier grade NAT and some NAT IPv4 to 6 translation tunneling that exists within the IPv6 protocol. For most home internet users, you could get by without an IPv4 address. Well, I think it's about time we move away from it, but yeah. There'll be a few steps to take. And, um, I mean, it's kind of scary for them because they definitely have a shortage down there. They've, they've used up all of their allotment. So, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the NSA for just a minute. Uh, there's some funny things happening right now. So the NSA, of course, they're being sued by everybody from the EFF to, to Juul. And uh, a lot of the, you know, the lawsuits came out after Snowden released all of this information. And what's really, really funny here is, you know, the courts are telling them, okay, we need all this information, we need all this data, uh, we need to know what you're doing, and they're not producing anything, and their excuses are hilarious. For instance, right now they're saying that, um, that their systems are so complex that they, they couldn't possibly have stopped uh, their systems from deleting data that was, that was needed for these lawsuits. So it's like, oh, our, our system, we can't even keep track of it. And, um, I mean, it's like, whenever they need something, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go crazy finding it in their database. And, they, and whenever they, they, they try to keep everything that happens, you know, when they've got the, the massive facility out in Utah. So they're trying to collect all this data, but whenever something's needed for a lawsuit, it's magically either, you know, the system deleted it or we can't find it because our systems are too complex. That's kind of a ridiculous double standard, but it looks like they may actually get away with this as, an, you know, an excuse. And it's completely ridiculous. Why do we even have a system... If it's so unorganized that we can't find something simple that's needed for a lawsuit, why is it even there? So are you telling me that if we had data in the system and it was related to Al-Qaeda or bin Laden or anything, that we couldn't preserve that information? Is that what you're telling me? Because that sounds like what you're telling me. Oh, no, that, that's totally fine. If it's something they want to charge, or maybe it's like you know some kid in Kansas who said that he was a hacker on Facebook. We'll, we're going to keep all that stuff. But if it's something that's needed, you know, in a, in a lawsuit from like a case against or a case where the EFF is fighting, no, the, the, the system is just too complex. How could you expect us to, to ever find that? Not gonna definitely happen. doesn't ring true. I mean, are they saying that it's like we've got this checkbox here and it's like is terrorist, and <laughs> uh, you know we're not going to check is terrorist because other bad things will happen to this block of data if we check is terrorist. It's better to just let the system delete it. But if we checked is terrorist, it would totally retain that. But if we checked is terrorist, it would also dispatch the CIA and this individual would be disappeared. And then we would have to talk about that program. So we're not going to talk about that program. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Snowden. Um, now, Al Gore, right? Al Gore actually came out and said something very interesting about Snowden. He didn't say that he was a whistleblower, but he got pretty damn close. He didn't call him a traitor like you know, everybody else in government does. Uh, he actually said that uh, Al Gore's leaks were an important service, and he said that, you know, he, he did say that, that uh, Snowden had done some bad things. He said that, you know, what, what Snowden did was illegal, but what he did does not even compare. Uh, <laughs> does not even compare. It, it is nothing in comparison to the revelations of, you know, all these different constitutional violations that have been, you know, shown through his revelations. That was a terribly convoluted statement, but I think you guys understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so basically it's just Al Gore is saying 
yeah, he leaked classified material, but look at this. This there's no way that anybody would say this is constitutional. And our dear leader, who is a constitutional law professor, ought to know better. That's implied. It's not actually stated. But uh, yeah, so I think I think it's pretty interesting that we have Al Gore saying that he's basically doing a public service by revealing this information, and he's not. I mean, it's it's not to me. It's not even anymore the information that he revealed. It's that he's done it in such a brilliant way that everything that he's revealed, they've immediately spun and lied about, and then he releases more to show that they're still lying. And so they've been lying about literally everything, and that level of insanity is worse than what they're actually doing because that level of insanity will lead to worse things, and there's no evidence they're changing their behavior. I mean, right now it's so bad as far as what you know the Constitution goes that if we decided to take any action against anybody, all of them would have to go. Like, if someone decided to, like, call out Obama for violating the Constitution, well, that guy in Congress who calls him out is probably going to have to be thrown out for violating the Constitution. It's that bad right now. Every single one of them, maybe, save two or it three, would have to be thrown out. It really is. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, that was totally not about hardware. We, we probably had enough hardware at Computex, so no more hardware until, like, two more days. So give us a couple days, and we'll have... The next video covering hardware and gaming and all that sort of thing. I need to go take a nap, man. I'm, I hope you guys can't tell that I'm like dying of exhaustion. Since I've been back from Computex, you guys, it's been like 12 hours a day of work catching up. But yeah. Well, you know, uh, before, we, before we wrap it up, two things that would be good for this video. One, there's a lot of awesome hardware coming up in Computex. But also, too, you know, you were inside China. How is the internet over there? I mean, we always talk about in the NSA and the Great Firewall of China and blah, blah, blah. But you were literally there. How is that? Okay, so, yeah, this is interesting. Now, Taipei or Taiwan and China are extremely different when it comes to the internet. So I'll give you guys a breakdown on the experience in both. Now, China was kind of a nightmare. Um, you could get on and there was decent speeds, but every website was throttled. Uh, like, if you wanted to use Google, it would work but I would have to refresh the page 10 times and then it would take about a minute and a half to load up my Gmail. So you, you go to yahoo.com, it was like that. Like, I was like, whoa. And then you go to speed test and it's like, oh, I've got 20 down, it should be just fine. So it's very weird. Like there, there are some services that are completely cut off. You go to Facebook, can't do it. You go to YouTube, YouTube is gone because someone posted a police brutality video and that pissed off the government. So YouTube is completely gone. But other services, the services that haven't exactly violated anything that, that you know, the government just doesn't like, like Gmail and Gchat and stuff, they just kind of don't work. Every once in a while they work a little bit, but it, it's to the point where you have to go use Yahoo or something else. So China was weird. I was finally able to get online. Uh, I, private internet access did not work because China is so smart. They are able to detect when you're on a VPN. So you connect on a VPN and they immediately disable the IP that you're connecting through or whatever you're doing. They immediately disable your connection. You can go to like one website for 30 seconds and then you're done. So what I had to do is I had to uh, enable the craziest encryption uh, available. It's called Chameleon on uh, uh, Viper VPN. And using the Chameleon encryption, I was able to connect and I only was getting a couple megabits per second, but I was able to use all the services finally. Now Kane, on the other hand, has T-Mobile and T-Mobile just started this new, you know, you can roam anywhere in the world type of thing, data roaming. And I don't know what's going on, but he was able to connect to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, everything right from his phone on T-Mobile while we were in China. I was just, I kept looking over my shoulder thinking any minute now somebody's going to tackle him while he's walking around like talking to people on Twitter in China. Like I was like, oh God, so there's going to be like some guy's going to kill us. But it didn't happen and I don't know. How T-Mobile has this has made this happen? I'm thinking they may be doing it, and it's a new service, and maybe the government doesn't know that all these services are working on T-Mobile, so maybe that's going to go away soon. But yeah, going over to Taiwan, however, uh, in Taipei, the internet is stupid fast. There's there's no bandwidth caps. There's no I mean everything's unmetered. They don't care what you're doing. If you and, and like most of the places I went to. Uh, it was like, you know, if, if your connection is 20 megabits down, you get 20 megabits up. It's, it was awesome. And um, if, you, if you're a citizen in Taipei, you can go anywhere in the city and you have free uh, Wi-Fi. And I think you could, if, you, if you're traveling, you know, some hotels, they also give you access to that free Wi-Fi. Uh, but yeah, anywhere in the city, there's Taipei free, free Wi-Fi um, 
uh, or Taipei, Taipei Wi-Fi. I'm not sure if it's free, but yeah, you, you pretty much have access to it if you're living there. Uh, it's not extremely fast, but once you get connected to the regular internet in the city, it's so fast. It's the way it should be in, in like a modern civilized society. But they're, they're, when, I, when I was there, I felt like I was in a Blade Runner movie. It's so, they're so far ahead of us. So all you guys who have never been out of the country that keep saying that the USA is the best country in the world, you know, it may be in some areas, but as far as infrastructure goes, as far as the internet goes, as far as, you know, a lot of other things go, stop sounding ignorant and saying things like that because once you travel a little bit, you'll realize that America is just another country and they're a country that's doing a lot of very strange things. That's the end of rant for that. I think that's probably a good place to end the video. Sweet. Uh, we have a lot of footage coming up yep. from China. We're going to show you guys some like, some of the stuff we did, like, you know, behind the scenes. We went to some crazy trips and monasteries and just, you know, give you guys an idea of what life on the streets is like. Uh, you know, some ideas of what it's like in Taipei as well. And I'm, I think half of you guys are going to move there if you see what Taipei is like. It is wild. Other than the fact that it's way too hot, but yeah. So we'll see you guys in the next video. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. See you guys later.